Pursuers Chapter 3, First Part The manor of Bar and the main entrance varied in each town and village, but in McRoy it was a palisade of thick tree trunks sunk side by side. And the gates could slide back to the fence on either side, and Dee turned to the one on the right and pushed it in, and during the opening it left in a great palisade around the town. Once through the gate, he commanded an excellent view of the main street and the homes lining either side of it. No smell of blood, that's odd. The hunter's left hand murmured as it gripped the reins. It sounded as if it would have had its head cocked to one side. Of course, there's no signs of anyone either, said D. Beneath the black brim of his traveler's hat, his eyes held a quiet gleam. His horse didn't halt. On encountering a weird situation, it was normal people who felt an urge to kill. Once through the entrance, the horse and rider stood down the main thoroughfare, swaddled in stark sunlight. Not a single soul was on the street, and the hunter rode without so much as a glance at the rows of houses to either side, his steed not stopping until they were in front of a saloon. Dismounting, Dee tethered the horse's reins to a post. No one's here, the horse voice was heard to say once the hunter had pushed open the door. In the quiet interior of the establishment boiled the horse voice's words, however. There were people here about an hour ago, the horse voice continued. There's nicotine and alcohol in the air. Dee looked down at an ashtray on the table. A cigarette had fallen from it, burning the table and leaving a long strip of ash on its shape. Most of the tables had glasses and cards on them, though a few had been overturned, spilling their contents. Following the path of the disturbance, the hunter saw a broken glass on the floor and a half-dried puddle of alcohol. There's half a steak here, with a piece of it still stuck on the fork. In other words, something happened just as they were taking a bite. Something that made them drop their glasses in and cigarettes. Dee twisted around to face the door. And that was the direction most of the chairs pulled away from the tables faced. The patrons had pushed their chairs back and risen to face whatever had come through the door. And there's no smell of gunpowder. Somebody might have drawn a sword. But it looks like most of them accepted their fate without doing a thing. Said the hoarse voice. Dee went over to the bar and looked behind the counter. A double-barreled shotgun still sat in the customary place. It appeared the bartender hadn't even had time to go for the weapon. What came in? The hoarse voice didn't answer. D went outside. What's this? The hoarse voice exclaimed, sounding intrigued. There was no sign of the hunter's cyborg horse. <laughs> That's no small feat, taking the horse without you or me noticing it. You're the one who didn't notice. Uh-huh. A formless presence is on the move. It came from the center of town and got rid of the horse. Where'd it go? Back. In less than five minutes' of time, Dee stood in front of an old cylindrical building. A theater. And though entertainment on the frontier wasn't as rare as those in the capital believed, anything culturally redolent of the capital was restricted to the traveling plays and concerts that might visit a few times a year. It was easy to dismiss those who constructed such theaters, both large and small, as bumpkins or pretentious posers. But in a theater much smaller and simpler than this, in a community far more isolated than this town, one Yuna O'Connor, considered the world's greatest violinist, had packed the house day in and day out from the time he was a child. He referred to the boards of the theater's wood plank stage as his parents. The front doors had been left wide open, and Dee passed through one of the many doors set in the wall within. It is said to be the theater stage, a stone floor about thirty feet in diameter. It was surrounded by stone seats that radiated out from it and climbed gradually to a height of about fifteen feet. On the frontier, theater was like a drug that people had a love-hate relationship with. The genius playwright Ox had worked for the nobility, penning this series of plays called the Aristocrat Saga, in which any nameless hick actor could deliver his lines in a monotone, and the seasoned audience members would still offer up thunderous applause that would shake the sunlight, the moonlight, and even the wind. Regrettably, this time, there was no applause at all. D turned first as if moving his head to catch the sound of the wind, and then angled his eyes upward. In the last row of seats on the northern side was a man with his hair pulled back in a ponytail. He wore a leather cape over a reddish floor-length coat. Nice of you to come. Thought maybe I was going to have to get you. And grinning from ear to ear, he said, I'm Isaac Nausea. I'm a drifter and a warrior. I'm always wanted to meet the great D we hear so much about all over the frontier. Who hired you? 
less than five minutes of time, Dee stood in front of an old cylindrical building, a theater. And though entertainment on the frontier wasn't as rare as those in the capital believed, anything culturally redolent of the capital was restricted to the traveling plays and concerts that might visit a few times a year. It was easy to dismiss those who constructed such theaters, both large and small, as bumpkins or pretentious posers. But in a theater much smaller and simpler than this, in a community far more isolated than this town, one Yuna O'Connor, considered the world's greatest violinist, had packed the house day in and day out from the time he was a child. He referred to the boards of the theater's wood plank stage as his parents. The front doors had been left wide open, and Dee passed through one of the many doors set in the wall within. This had to be the theater stage, a stone floor about thirty feet in diameter. It was surrounded by stone seats that radiated out from it and climbed gradually to a height of about fifteen feet. On the frontier, theater was like a drug that people had a love-hate relationship with. The genius playwright Ox had worked for the nobility, penning this series of plays called the Aristocrat Saga, in which any nameless hick actor could deliver his lines in a monotone, and the seasoned audience members would still offer up thunderous applause that would shake the sunlight, the moonlight, and even the wind. Regrettably, this time, there was no applause at all. Dee turned first as if moving his head to catch the sound of the wind, and then angled his eyes upward. In the last row of seats on the northern side was a man with his hair pulled back in a ponytail. He wore a leather cape over a reddish floor-length coat. Nice of you to come. Thought maybe I was going to have to get you. And grinning from ear to ear, he said, I'm Isaac Nausea. I'm a drifter and a warrior. I'm always wanted to meet the great D we hear so much about all over the frontier. Who hired you? My Baron Mitterhaus. I'm sure you must have heard of him. He was a big deal back in the day, with two hundred villages and a hundred and forty-eight towns under his thumb in these parts. The first Mitterhaus was attacked and slain by the lousy farmers, but the one who took his place prides himself on his head in power. He's not anyone I've been hired to deal with. So why is he gunning for you, you wonder? On account of you're just so damn good looking? Nah, just kidding. It's not you I've got business with. It's the girl. Why? Damned if I know. Nausea replied, shrugging his shoulders. His ponytail swayed. But if a frontier noble went to all the trouble of hiring me and the rest to catch her, he's probably got a damn good reason. So if you'll keep out of this, I won't mess with you. Just tell yourself you barely know her. From the start, she'd been someone D barely knew. But if someone had been able to peer into his mind at that moment, they'd undoubtedly have seen something quite interesting. The man whose beauty shamed the very sunlight stared silently at the other man. A harpy later, Nausea leapt out of his seat like a shot from a gun. Well, surprise, surprise. I heard Dee was a loner through and through. Since when do you side with a woman that's got nothing to do with you? Oh, I get it. She hired you, did she? Nausea's tall frame trembled fiercely. Now that's a real look you've got in your eye. I've come across a ton of asses saying they've been through hell and back. But you're the real deal. It'll be an honor to fight you. What happened to the people in this town? Nausea furrowed his brow. The hunter's gorgeous, steely voice had suddenly changed to the hoarse tones of a geezer. You practicing your ventriloquism or something? Oh, as for the townsfolk, my pet doggy got him. They were gobbled up? Pretty much. My body only needs to eat once a month, but you wouldn't believe how much he packs away. Swallowed everything from cyborg horses to house cats. But in the meantime, the stagecoach bolted. If it weren't for that, we'd have lured that girl in here with you. Not a problem, though. Sorry, but you're going to drown in the sea of acid in my buddy's stomach. Here it comes, the hoarse voice said. Dee stood there quietly. It was as if he hadn't even heard the voice. Perhaps frightened by that blossom of black eyes, Nausea shouted loudly, Come on out, buddy. Dee's eyes reflected something white gushing from the man's mouth. A shadow passed across the sun. In midair, the form spread like a pink parasol. The umbrella looked to be more than thirty feet across, and a split second before its lower rim could touch the ground behind the hunter, and there was a silvery flash from Dee's back. The blade he drew slashed at least six feet into the thing, and then Dee bounded into the air. He landed a good six feet from the rim of the umbrella. Not good, an urgent tone from the vicinity of his left hand told him. Dee's body was tinged with white. The rim of his travelers had the hem of his coat, and more than anything, the blade of his sword were giving off a whitish smoke. In the instant the umbrella was cut, a transparent liquid had poured like rain from inside it. It was acid strong enough to melt the steel blade of the hunter's sword. That thing, it's his stomach. And the 
the left hand whispered. And that acid could dissolve iron. You'd do well to avoid it. D discarded his sword. Before him was a rippling mass of digestive organs the size of a small bog, which quickly began giving off the same white smoke. From a distance, Nausea called out, I should expect as much from the man known as D. Will we take each other down now or call to draw? Page 53, a picture of these. He ended in a cry of pain. A needle of stark wood hurled by D had pierced the white smoke and nausea. You... You SOB. I can't believe you. As he grunted in a tone of astonishment and despair, the pale pink ground rose up. Leaping more than fifteen feet away from the thing bearing down on him like a tsunami, D went for the dagger on his hip with his right hand. The white smoke suddenly pulled back. As it was sucked into the theater seats with surprising speed, it called to mind a deflating balloon. There was no sign of nausea. You threw a second needle at him, but it missed all his vitals. He's not too shabby either. Sniffing loudly, the hoarse voice continued. From the scent of blood, I think you might have nailed him in an artery. He won't be moving for a while. But if Mitterhaus of all people is gunning for her, that girl sure must have a hell of a secret. <laughs> jamming his left hand against the brim of his traveler's hat. D charged toward where Nausea had been. His running speed was so great it seemed as if he flew there. Blood had spilled on the floor, and D's eyes followed a trail of splotches to a narrow exit. He headed for it without hesitation. The hunter's left hand had shifted from the hat to the hem of his coat, where a coughed and sputtered as it said, As always, you're a hard master for your left hand. You're gonna make me get rid of all this strong acid, too? He quickly continued. What's wrong? Snap out of it. One hand still braced against the stone wall, and Dee was slowly sinking toward the floor. His back quaked, and the massive bloody spot on the floor spread like a crimson blossom. Poison blood. And the hoarse voice said in a stuffy tone, holding his breath. Less than a second later, the next gob of blood flew, bringing a goy flower into bloom on one of the seats. First part, and... Second part. The sound of singing reached their ears less than five minutes after Dee had gone into town. Both of them looked around, but of course there was no sign of anyone. It was a phantasmal voice, seeming to come both from the heavens on high and the bowels of the earth. A woman's voice that would hardly be described as beautiful, yet at some point both the idea of searching for the source of the song, and that of fleeing to somewhere where they'd no longer hear it vanished from Maria's mind. And the voice was like the threads of a mysterious spider's web, snacking Arias and Meeker's brains, digging into them, restricting the movements of the most critical faculties. Turning to Meeker, Arias said, Let's go. Okay. Meeker nodded. His eyes, like hers, were strangely unfocused. Taking the reins, the huntress turned her cyborg horse around, and the two of them began riding back the way they'd come. Before they'd gone five hundred yards, a desolate rocky place appeared to the right. A short time earlier, they'd pass this spot without any trouble. Here and there, the rocks were punctuated with dashes of green in the form of such plants as rough bloom and water-free grass and patches of varying size but similar shape. In keeping with the rumors that this had been one of the nobility's quarries in ancient times, chunks and slabs of cut stone were lying all around. It soon became apparent that the pair's destination was about a hundred feet ahead, a slab of rock that laid an angle with its right end sticking up. Who would have thought to cut such a piece of stone? How had they managed it, and why had they abandoned it? Though the end was only about thirty feet in the air, the slab seemed to stretch through the entire quarry, easily surpassing six hundred feet in length. It was about thirty feet wide, and more than ten feet thick. The apparent foolishness of whoever had cut it was overridden by the sense of grandeur the slab inspired, with its mass probably in excess of three hundred tons. Even on seeing the beautiful woman seated at the upper end of the slab, brushing her hair, the two travelers didn't reveal so much as a wisp of emotion on their faces. Before long, they'd crunched across the rocks to reach the base of the stone slab, at which point the singing seemed to cut off. If a student or a scholar who'd heard the ancient legends had been there, they probably would have been able to recall the name of the siren who sat atop an enormous stone, possessed of a rare singing voice that bewitched those steering their boats up and down the great river below, and led them to reduce their craft to flotsam on the jagged rocks. 
and dressed in a gossamer robe of silver, and the woman had hair so golden the light of the sun paled by comparison. After standing up and bounding from the stone, she landed lightly in front of the pair. Her robe seemed to go on forever. Its folds swung elegantly in the breeze. Welcome, my name is Lorelai. I'm so pleased you seem to enjoy my song. Maria knew instinctively that this woman was evil. Her luring singing voice, the spectacularly acrobatic entrance she'd made, and more than anything, the sensuousness and air of the supernatural that billowed from her captivating form were proof of that. Jealousy. She had to get Meeker to a safe place so she could counterattack. However, that notion dissolved in the powerful acids of her brain, changing, keeping Aria from fighting. Still, on seeing the huntress's hand begin to creak toward the scabbard on her hip, the woman, Lorelai, smiled alluringly. Even a full-fledged warrior can't move a muscle when he hears my song. You're really something special. It's no use, though. Hear it once, and you're my slave. Now come with me. The woman took Aria's horse by the bride and was about to walk away when she halted. Looking behind Aria, she said, Can't have any unnecessary baggage. I have no use for you, so I'll do away with you here. Gesturing with one arm to the end of the stone slab she'd occupied, she said, There's something just interesting just over there. See it and die. And though her tone was businesslike, and there was enough seductiveness in Lorelai's voice to make up for it. Even a grown man would do whatever, she said without being under her spell, and no other man would blame him for it. Nodding, Meeker got down off the horse. Watching the diminutive figure skillfully scramble up a rock shelf, the beauty who called herself Lorelai twisted her lips into an evil grin, and then started down the road Aria had come by. And as she did, the terrible siren song once again began to issue from her vermilion lips. The same song reverberated in Meeker's brain, and as it did, the suggestion he'd just received, to see what was over there and die, became a powerful compulsion. He didn't have strength enough left to fight it. Reaching Lorelai's slab of stone, the boy climbed to the top and looked over the other side. And there he stood, rooted, a scene spread before him. Though interesting, it could hardly be called fascinating. In his present state of mind, nothing Meeker saw would move him. But even if he'd been in his right mind, he probably wouldn't have comprehended what he was seeing, or not so much what as where. The rock had been cleanly cut away to a depth of three feet and an area almost thirty feet square. On the midpoint of each side, just beyond the edge of the newly square depression, were holes for what must have been pillars. And judging by the face that remained on a ten-foot-tall religious icon that stood before the hole on the northern side, and this had been, if not a temple, and then at least a place for some sort of religious rituals. However, it was undoubtedly something other than this that Lorelai had described as interesting. In the carved-out section were steep, were steep stone steps, a huge stone altar, some sort of washing area and rust-covered machines whose purpose was unknown, and bizarre creatures were wriggling on or around all of these things. A human adult might barely be able to get their arms around the thick, ten-foot-long body of one of these creatures. In form, they resembled colossal leeches, while their supple movements called to mind a smaller version of the great worms. There seemed to be dozens of them, and the way they writhed in the sunlight, twitching and twisting, was so horrible it would have caused the boy to run away screaming had his will been his own. In fact, Miko's feet became rooted for an instant, Lorelai's suggestion forgotten. However, it was only for an instant. And erasing the vision of terror that filled his eyes, the boy walked toward the awful work room of death without further hesitation. And the creatures infesting the work area were carnivores. While most were similar species, usually inhabited dark, swampy areas, this kind could also operate in daylight, which aided them in gathering food. The secret of the vitality was pressurized water reserves stored beneath their skin which allowed them to remain above ground for nearly twelve hours. Their nest was under this area, and they would periodically surface and crawl around, feeding on spiders and birds and travelers. And now the sorts of delectable morsel they hadn't tasted for decades was headed into their midst. Their olfactory senses caught the odor of their prey. The sensors in their skin cells felt the vibrations of feet making contact with the ground. Their hearing made out the footsteps. They could even catch the sound of the blood pumping through the prey's veins. They lacked sight. The writhing denizens of the earth's depths had no use for eyes. The remaining senses conveyed everything. Big, soft, tasty. That was how the information would have looked in human language, and their primitive senses transformed the hunger that pervaded them into adrenaline. Moving their long bodies just like inchworms, the invertebrates raced toward their prey. Two forces tormented Meeker. One was Lorelai's command to die, 
the other a primal wish for self-preservation, and though the two urges clashed, he backed away only a single step before halting. One of the instincts before him closed to within ten feet. It had a blunt head split in a cross shape. Its crimson maw had rows of stark fangs like glassy thorns. A streak of light fell from the sky. Over Meeker's head, the small gleam became dozens of arrows of light that lanced through the insects' bodies. Surprisingly enough, the projectiles pierced the very rock. Most of them had found their mark, but the few that hadn't were jetting from the stone of the quarry. Perhaps those strays had been intended for the creature that ignored its shuddering compatriots and launched it, suffered Meeker. However, just as its pernicious fangs were but to close on the boy's head, a horizontal streak of silver pierced the loathsome insect. On landing, Dee hurled three more needles that impaled the remaining creatures, then coughed violently. The left hand he used to cover his mouth was stained with blood. You haven't fully recovered yet, and I ain't so hot either. Even when Mika heard the hoarse voice say that, his color didn't return, and he looked impassively at Dee in his ghastly state. He's mesmerized, I'd say. The hoarse voice remarked, sounding somewhat pained. Dee put his bloodstained hand to Mika's head. Well, I'll be. He's been captivated by the Lorelei song. Not good. He'll stay this way until the one who borned him is slain or the spell is broken. And you could do it, couldn't you? Dee said. His lips and mouth were both covered with fresh blood. Even racked by deadly poison, he had a voice as cold as ice and steel. Yeah, it's pretty painful, though. For which of you? Me, actually. The hunter's hand went flat against Mika's brow. A faint groan could be heard, but Dee paid no mind, no mind. But Dee paid it no mind, surveying his surroundings as he held the pose. A cloud rolled across the heavens, and the shadow it cast on the earth casually crept from east to west, and when it reached the young man and the boy in the quarry, Dee had already taken his left hand away. Scooping up the reeling meeker, he went over to the impaled insects, piercing them at an angle, and sticking into the rock below were silver arrows over two feet long. Silver! The hoarse voice murmured, sounding impressed. Second part end. Third part. Silver. As a protection against evil, Dee said, evaluating the balance of one of the arrows as he looked up at the sky. Could it be? With those hoarse words, a human face began to rise from the palm of Dee's left hand. Astonishingly enough, it was grinning. Was it that girl, Dee? Dee clenched his fist. With a squeal, the human face faded. Its appearance had been fleeting. Shaking his head a bit, Mika asked, Did someone scream just now? He was staring at the hunter's left hand. You must have imagined it. Okay. The stupefied boy still didn't quite comprehend either this situation or the one before it, yet his ears caught a voice sound entirely angry or cold, saying, What are you trying to weasel out of this? If we're talking silver arrows here, it can only be her, Gianna. And he gave his hand a violent shake, as if to deal at the coup de grace, and then asked, Can you walk? Nodding, the boy stiffened. He just remembered the business with the demonic invertebrates. Wrapping his arms around himself, he was starting to collapse when Dee said to him, Aria was taken. The hunter's words ran a stiff wire through the boy's sagging frame. Taken? Where is she? You were the last one to see her. Stunned, Miko shrank back. The little blue eyes in the tiny face blinked repeatedly, then unexpectedly focused on a point in space. Oh, that's right. There was this woman named Lorelai, and she went that way. He pointed in the direction of the road that had brought Dee there. How long ago was this? After thinking for a moment, the boy replied, I don't really know. Ten minutes, maybe twenty. I'm going after them. You wait here. No. No way am I doing that. I'll bring her back. You'll just be in the way. The boy fell silent. I, I could help, somehow. No one's after you. Just stay here a while. With her waiting for Mika's reply, Dee leapt from the stone lip and sailed through the air. Will we make it in time? You don't have a horse. The hoarse voice said, becoming a wind that whispered in the hunter's ear. As he landed, Dee raised his left hand. Fortunately, we're downwind of them, yes sir. The hoarse voice said with satisfaction. Those woods over there. But make it fast. I smell blood. We might be too late. Less than two minutes later, Dee charged into the forest more than a mile and a quarter away from the quarry. Although it stood to reason that a dampier would inherit some of the leg strength of the nobility, this young man had a speed that would shock even pure-blooded nobles. Taking no measure of his surroundings, he dashed another two hundred yards, then halted. There we go, the hoarse voice said. A clearing suddenly appeared between the clusters of trees. 
and just off to the right stood a black carriage with a team of four horses, and about ten feet from it a rear crouched on the ground, lavishly decorated with gold and drawn by gorgeous black steeds, and the carriage was clearly that of a noble. The rear had been brought to this clearing by Lorelei, and a noble had been waiting here. It was obvious what had occurred. Even the speed of these legs hadn't been enough to prevent this tragedy from unfolding. However, before Dee could even approach Aria, he noticed something. There was no smell. Actually, there was the lingering scent one would expect to come from the gore clinging to the dagger Aria clutched in her hand, but no scent of blood drifted from her, and her throat was free of wounds. Looks like she's okay. Not only that, but she might have bagged a prize turkey, too. The horse voice was referring to the jet black cape and other garments that lay midway between Aria and the carriage. Ash gray dust clung to them in spots. Dee lifted the cape. And dust billowed up, falling back to the earth or riding off on the almost imperceptible breeze. A knife for self-defense and a bracelet with electronic weaponry, plus the cigar and that crest. No doubt about it. These are all that remain of Mitterhouse. The hoarse voice trailed off in surprise. And he looked at Aria. It's just, well, I can't really see that girl dispatching a noble. It's just, well... I can't really see that girl dispatching a noble and not even getting bit. When you think about it, Mitterhouse is a ruthless, vile monster. One of the ten worst on the entire frontier. To take him down so easily. Mm. Is that someone else over there? Beyond the enormous tree that loomed behind the carriage, a foot in silvery robes could be glimpsed. Going over to check, Dee found the corpse of Lorelai, who had been stabbed through the heart from behind with a dagger. He also discovered the driver reduced to dust still in his perch on the carriage. First, this Lorelei brought a rear here was stabbed from behind and killed. By the workmanship on the dagger, it seems Mitterhouse may have done the deed personally. Following that, Mitterhouse tried to attack a rear, but was slain, and his driver was killed as well. After that skillful explanation, the horse voice fell into silence for a short time. Mitterhouse either attacked a rear or put her in the carriage so he could take her away. A rear <laughs> must have been able to stab him because Lorelei had been put. Down first. Aria ran outside, Mitterhouse followed her out here, and that's where he croaked. His driver was trying to save him when he met his end. Got any problem with that? Nope. Dee responded. With the spell of Lorelei's song broken, Aria slew the noble. Simple enough, but easier said than done. Right you are. As good of a hunter as she might be. I could see her taking out some pseudo-nobility or hired warriors, but not slaying a greater noble with millennia under his belt this easily. Not even if she got the drop on him. After all, once Lorelai's power over her was broken, Mitterhouse probably would have used his own hypnotism on her. Or did it not affect her? And though it seemed much longer, less than two minutes had passed since Dee had found Aria. Mitterhouse is destroyed. Dee told her, Did you slay him? Not moving her eyes from the spot on the ground where they were fixed, she replied, I don't know. Can't recall anything. The last thing I remember, here I was. D, when did you get here? It was you that took down Mitterhouse, wasn't it? Unfortunately, no. Dee's gaze once again focused on the pale nape of her neck. Not even his eyes could find the faintest flaw. He put his left hand against her forehead as well, but there was nothing out of the ordinary there. And that was the end of the matter. A tremendous mystery seemed to linger nearby with its maw gaping disturbingly wide. But Dee got Aria up on her feet, then helped her onto one of the horses from the garage. Dee, what on earth's going on with me? She asked in a tone so doleful she seemed to doubt whether tomorrow would even come. Take the reins. And Dee replied. His good looks and cool voice seemed enough to solve Aria's mystery. Nodding as if she understood as much, the warrior woman gripped the reins. Eh? smile rising on her lips. Chapter 3 ends.